Good afternoon and welcome to the Skills Masterclass Cultural Diplomacy in the Indian Skills System. This is class number six. My name is Sujit Danji and I'm the manager for Victorian Government Projects and the Director for Cultural Diplomacy Program at the Australia India Institute. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are holding this webinar today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulan Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and their emerging leaders. I'm joined today by five guest panelists who bring a wealth of expertise to this cultural diplomacy webinar. Mr. Matthew Johnson, Minister Counselor, Education and Research, based at the Australian High Commission, Delhi, New Delhi. Nirti Mehta, Director, Swami Vivekananda Cultural Centre, Sydney. Arushi Gore, Business Director with the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. Sam Freeman, former Trade and Investment Commissioner, Austrade, Bengaluru, and co-founder of Workforce. Biju Kunamaran, founder and managing director of Healthcare Health Careers International Group Australia. Welcome. Our experts will share with us what cultural diplomacy entails for the Australian vet providers in the Indian skill system space. And also a very warm welcome to our audience. Please remember to post your questions in the Q&A link. Let me start the conversation with Matthew Johnston, who is a Minister Counselor Education Research for South Asia, covering India, Nepal and Sri Lanka. Prior to this appointment as counselor, he was also at the Australian Embassy in Brazil, where he helped establish the Brazil-Australia Centre for Internationalisation of Education, showcasing Australian excellence in higher education and also increasing awareness of Australia's industry-informed VET system between the two countries. Matthew, could you start off and share some of your perspectives for this webinar, please? Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much, Sajid, for the invitation. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here at today's uh, Masterclass. Uh, today, I just want to offer some high-level uh, observations in my time that I've been here in India and engaging with um, the skills uh, ecosystem uh, from a government to government perspective. So, so my role here in Delhi is, um, you know, government to government engagement uh, with key education and skills ministries, regulators and other uh, peak bodies. Uh, we work to, you know, promote uh, the quality of Australian skills training, uh, but also to seek to influence policy settings for greater uh, interoperability of our skill systems and to create opportunities for our um, our skill sector uh, here in India. Um, so this year, as everyone probably knows very well, India is the president for the G20. And um, I've been very fortunate to be able to participate in a number of uh, education uh, working groups um, this year and um, talking with a number of my counterparts around Delhi but also my colleagues here in the High Commission and others and what's become very very clear there is a core underpinning theme to a lot of the discussions happening whether it be in trade, in health, uh, in foreign affairs and that all comes down to skills and to skilling India's priorities very recently in, um, you know, improving the quality and really uh, modernizing its skills training system is embedded in all aspects of their G20 presidency, supporting all industries, whether it be tourism, whether it be trade and investment, you name it, it is there. It is um, a massive kind of matrix that the government of India is trying to bring together and hone um, and learn of best practices from all G20 and invited member countries uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, one is around a global citizenship uh, approach. So sharing best practices across skilling and education and other key sectors, uh, the government of India have produced some really good, and I encourage everyone to go and find them online, um, compendiums and comparators of best practices across countries. Uh, 
really, I see this in the context of uh, sharing best practices given globalization, the need for globally mobile workforce, and of course, the government of India's ambition to be the skilled capital uh, for the world. It also really supports the uh, sort of the leapfrogging that's happening here in terms of the skill system um, in India as well. And so bringing of best practices from all around the world for the skills ecosystem um, within India. So Australia has been a long-term partner uh, with the government of India and other, part, uh, other providers and institutions across India for some time, um, both at the higher education and skills level. And probably the observation I'd make is I think the relationship in higher education really uh, leaped forward um, a lot earlier than in, in skills, and it probably just reflects um, where things are at in terms of the evolution of skills and the need for skills. And I think Arushi's is going to touch on sort of some of the reasons for this and the perceptions of skills training um, in her presentation. So I would say, you know, for a long while, our higher education sector has really seen the opportunity and partnered with India and um, our skill system has been um, doing that as well, but the stage at which both systems are at are quite different. Um, some of the other learnings and observations I'd make is that through, through the G20, but also through the domestic reforms, which there are plenty that are happening here in India, it is clear that there is now a very strong focus on skilling and enhancing the um, capability, but also quality of training, and not just for uh, you know, international mobility, but also for uh, domestic best practices. So in our engagement with the minister here in India, that ability to bring workforce practices, industry practices back is at the heart of um, uh, the desire for increased cooperation in skills and in skilling. And um, to say that this space is fast moving and changing is probably an understatement. And although things have evolved differently between higher education and the skilling sector, change is happening here really dramatically. And um, you can really see that in terms of the, the practices that are being implemented, the government policy reforms that now very much look and feel like the skills ecosystem um, in Australia. So the potential for some of that interoperability and exchange and partnership I think he's starting to really grow and crystallize now. But it's not, it's not static and it's not linear. Um, skilling in terms of a, a terminology, what I've kind of been interested to learn in my time here and the narrative around skilling is, is that it happens at any point in time. No long gone are the days of a linear trajectory from school to further education. Um, skilling very much is talked about at any point in life and it can occur anywhere. It doesn't just occur in traditional um, institutions as we might think about in terms of ITIs or the TAFEs in Australia. It happens with industry, it happens within universities, and it can happen anywhere. So I think um, one of the key things that I've taken away for this is we think about vocational education system in Australia as being skills. India thinks far more broadly about uh, where skills are acquired, how they're acquired, and how you quantify, credential, and then implement them in the curriculum. And I think that's a really interesting um, learning, I think, for, for Australia to think about uh, in terms of how you explore partnerships. Um, the other point that I'd say that really makes a, a, a difference and is important is um, frameworks for cooperation. And so Australia's had a number of these in place at a government to government level for many years with India. It has promoted greater understanding. It ensures connectivity between sort of key people. And some of that really helps to, um, uh, you know, uh, re has really helped with um, strengthening systems both ways and creating potential future um, opportunities. Uh, and I just want to finish up uh, with an observation that I was told a couple of weeks ago when we had um, Minister for Skills and Training, Brendan O'Connor here, and we visited an ITI uh, within Delhi, and the, the the director of the ITI mentioned that um, some of their courses, uh, the demand and the popularity is growing absolutely immensely, and that they've got now some courses that have an entry score requirement of almost 100% to enter into an ITI. So that's quite a marked shift and change um, from what I understand and what I've been advised has, has occurred um, in the past. So that really shows uh, this industry-aligned, employability-focused um, skilling and education 
is in um, is in high demand here. Uh, but I'll pa pause there and pass back to you, Sajit, and to the other speakers. And thanks again for the opportunity to address everyone. Thank you. That's quite a lot to think about. Our second speaker is Nirti Mehta. Um, the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, which is part of the Indian um, Council for Cultural Relations, is connected to the Government of India. Nirti's work experience spans over 25 years in the cultural sector and across genres. Among her many qualifications, Nirti is a Shivaning um, Clore, a Salzburg Global Fellow, and Charles Wallace Indian Trust Scholar. Quite an accomplished um, uh, quite an accomplishment. Nirti will share some of her insights on cultural diplomacy, cultural differences, and nuances. Thank you, Nirti. Nirti? Right, I'm here. Namaste and greetings to you all. Thank you to the Honorable Lisa Singh, Dr. Tanji, and the Australia India Institute for this wonderful opportunity to participate in the Skills Masterclass on Cultural Issues. I'm delighted to be participating here today as I've had the wonderful opportunity to work across genres from conservation of monuments and museums to folklore and music. The views expressed here are my own. I've also had the privilege of working at a local, state, and national level in India in the cultural space and with countries seeking to collaborate with India. My areas of interest have been to create new ideas, projects, and partnerships. Earlier this year, as director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, I joined in March. SVCC is a part of, in, of ICCR, and our social media on Facebook and Twitter are ICCR in Australia. As SVCC, our role is to build cultural relations, exchanges, and mutual understanding between India and Australia. For the masterclass today, I would like to share three points. The first point is, culture connects and relationships are important in building long-term impact. They say the culture changes every 100 kilometers in India. A few years ago, I was in a car journey from Assam to Arunachal Pradesh on work. From the endless green paddy fields to bamboo houses, the landscape gradually changed to valleys of rhododendrons and wooden houses. As we stopped by on the way, we could hear the local dialects, notice the weave of the saris change, and taste the flavors of the local cuisine. Cultural connections fused with one another, and yet each was uniquely its own. We were fortunate to meet artists, craftsmen, musicians on our way. We did namaste, while some of the youngsters wanted to shake our hands. From Assam, Chai to Lal Chai and Arunachal. We not only had a wide range of teas, but as guests, we were first served, followed by the elders based on their seniority. Each gracious invite was followed with a gift, be it a handmade water hyacinth bag or a beaded bracelet. It was the thought that counted. And knowing the customs and traditions, we too reciprocated. Introduction via Mutual Connects was a wonderful way of opening new connections and gave us an added advantage. A little bit more about who we were and where we came from, let the conversation naturally rolling into work. The trip was a success and one of the most important outcomes was, we realized immense value of traveling and meeting people that not only enabled us to learn and expand our worldviews, but also appreciate the value of genuine reciprocity and mutual understanding. The second point is, understanding cultural nuances and differences gives us an added advantage. There was an exciting project a few years ago between two large cultural institutions. One of them was based in India. The project had stalled when I inherited it. The documents were well detailed, and as most Indians speak English, language was not a barrier. Discussions with the people on it resulted in a simple breakthrough. It seemed that as both institutions were from the cultural sector, they naturally felt the other spoke the same language. However, the geographical context was different and with it certain definitions. For example, the project manager's definition and role at one cultural institution varied from the other. 
with the miscommunication ironed out and the cultural nuances understood. The project was a great success. Even today, many years on, the wonderful relationship continues between both cultural institutions across both countries. The third point is, culture is a unique and extremely powerful enabler. At the global level, culture has been recognized as an enabler of growth and sustainable development. It is a key component of effective and inclusive multilateralism. India is hosting the G20 this year. As Mr. Amitabh Khan, the G20 chef, mentioned, India's cultural ethos has always emphasized the importance of inclusivity and unity in diversity, which is also reflected in our theme of Vasudeva Kutumbaka. The earth is one family. Protection and restitution of cultural property, harnessing living heritage for a sustainable future, promotion of cultural and creative industries and creative economy, and leveraging digital technologies for the protection and promotion of culture are the four priority areas. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said, we are proud of our rich and diverse culture. There have been numerous efforts towards revitalizing and honoring India's glorious heritage. When the Prime Minister put forward the Yoga Day resolution in 2014, 177 member states voted in favor of it. Today, it has a universal appeal and is practiced all over the world. Thus, I believe culture is not only an important economic sector, but also a powerful enabler to create a cohesive and multicultural society. I would once again like to thank the Australia India Institute for the opportunity of having me here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful narrative. I really enjoyed listening to you. Our next speaker is Arushi Gore. Prior to joining Austrade, um, Arushi has worked in uh, the consulting sector for Boston Consulting Group in the USA and Ernst & Young in the UK, as well as working for the Indian government. She's an economist by education and training and has worked at the intersection of education, skills and employment and large scale business transformation. Arushi, over to you, what would you like to share? Thank you very much, Sarjeet um, and Rihanna for all the support. Uh, as you all know, my name is Arushi Gore. I work as a business director for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission. I'm based out of the Australian High Commission in New Delhi. And Austrid is the uh, is the Australian government's international um, uh, investment attraction and trade attraction agency. And we're very happy to be a part of the skills webinar today here. Um, to talk about the Indian skilling ecosystem from a cultural standpoint and the cultural perception of skills in India, I would want to start by saying that in India, educational or skilling decisions are taken by the entire family or the entire neighborhood, to be honest. So it's not a very student-centric decision most of the times. Hence, the societal perceptions of how a skilling program will add value to the student's life um, to the kind of employment he will have access to, the kind of sectors he will have access to, is of paramount importance. Also in India, we are very recently seeing the rise of the middle class and the upper middle class segments. And in India, the middle class or the upper middle class segment has for long depended on education as a tool to gain access to resources, better incomes, and better lifestyle. Henceforth, the aspirational quotient in education and skills is extremely important for an Indian learner as well as an Indian parent. Now, what are these aspirations? Are Indian aspirations different from Australian aspirations? Well, I will try to answer this question. Um, so in India, certain, especially in the vocational segment, certain job roles command higher aspirational value than others. For example, given the importance and the contribution of technology or the tech sector in India's growth and um, robustness, um, certain job roles like, let's say, an AI specialist or artificial intelligence specialist or even a drone operator or a big data analyst are gaining extreme traction in the Indian domain. Um, apart from this, I would also like to talk about the National Education Policy 2020. If you'd like to know more about NEP 2020, um, I would suggest you go to the Indian government's website or just Google NEP 2020 and you can read up all you want about it. But to talk about NEP 2020 in brief, 
It was launched in 2020 as a means to reshape and remodel the Indian education and skills ecosystem. It lays great emphasis on collaborating skills or vocational skills within the educational remit and trying to provide an international exposure or international skills to the Indian students sitting in India as well. Um, so post NEP, what does it, what was the cultural change that it brought in India? I would say um, that skilling was hitherto an additional task for Indians, sort of like an icing on a cake. But post NEP 2020, skilling has entered the mainstream agenda in India. So it's no more and no more an additional task, but Indian universities and training providers are very eagerly trying to upskill the Indian workforce, given the fact that India has a greatly positive demographic dividend. We're a huge country. We're, I think, the most populated country in the world. And we also have the youngest cohort um, of, uh, of people in our country. So not only the government, which is very active and has budgeted mandates to ensure that the Indian workforce gets adequately skilled in industry-aligned segments, but also the Indian society is now fast adapting to accept the fact that Indians need to be skilled at par with the global standards. And Indian parents also, who were, I would say, hitherto very um, adamant about ensuring that their students or their kids are disciplined, get good grades in schools and colleges, grow up to be well-behaved, are now also seeing and realizing the importance of skilling their children, of ensuring that the students or the children are skilled in the right sectoral skills to be able to compete globally, because Indians are very competitive. <laughs> Uh, so talking about um, the more um, business aspects of skilling collaborations in India now, what is it like to interact and engage with skilling providers in India? I would say the three demand segments in India when it comes to skilling or vocational. Um, there are um, the private university segment, which is what you can see on my slide at the moment. There is the public university segment and there is an industry aligned training institute segment. So talking about the private university segment, I would say they have access to more resources in terms of financial budgets that they have access to. Um, they're also much faster, so they move faster with decisions. For example, we've been facilitating conversations between a set of Australian skills providers and a bunch of Indian private universities. So what we're seeing is that the private universities tend to move much faster with their decision-making processes because they do not have to go and seek approvals from various governmental ministries. Um, the Indian academic segment, I would say, is still very hierarchical in nature. So we would recommend you to be in touch with somebody who is um, in a decision-making position to be able to move things faster on the table. So now talking about the public university segment, I would say it does take time to push a decision forward with the public university because they have to be in touch with various departmental ministries, have to seek approval from various bodies. But the public university segment has access to vast majority or to the vast uh, student cohort. So they do have access to larger cohorts. So I think they're, they're the ones whom you should be in touch with if you're looking at a high volume Indian customer. They're also very well aware of all the governmental norms, the rules and the regulations, because they're working very closely with the Indian ministries. So while the private university will offer you a premium niche, a public university will offer you larger access to a higher volume. The third segment is the industry segments, which are more industry aligned training institute. I would say they function more. Um, I think they, they're more akin to the private university segment and also tend to move faster if they do see interest in certain skilling programs. And they're also very closely aligned to the industry bodies and lay more emphasis on jobs and employments, I would say. I would now like to talk about a few business, um, standard business protocols that you would want to consider if you're dealing or engaging with an Indian skills partner. I would say relationships in India are absolutely based on trust. So you have to engage and talk with your Indian partner. Indians love talking. They will ask you all sorts of personal as well as professional questions to how much are you earning, to why you're not married before you're 30, to what were you wearing to a party on last Friday. So do not feel offended by all these straight on straight questions that they probably throw your way. Try to engage with them, have more conversations with them. And Indians are a talkative lot, I would say. So that is one way to build rapport, connection and trust with an Indian partner. 
Indians also tend to lay emphasis on the tangible benefits on the from the Australian qualification or skills. So they'd want to know what more. So please ensure that your pitch to an Indian goes beyond the usual one. You're also able to bring to the table what an Indian student will get apart from the core skills and the technical knowledge that you're giving them, which is also very important, but maybe a set of extra credits or an industry exposure or an industry experience. So that is the way I think you would want to probably um, hold or steer a conversation. Indians also love negotiating. If they enter a fixed uh, price shop, they would still get a 10% discount on it. So do not be, <laughs> so do not, do not feel offended if an Indian tries to engage in a negotiation or bargaining session with you. Have it with an open mind. And English is also very widely spoken in India. So you don't have to worry about the language barrier being there. Um, Indians also lay a lot of emphasis to academic qualifications. So if you have a PhD and you're lucky enough to have a PhD, do mention that in your emails. Or if you have a higher order degree, I think that will help you get, get that soft spot with uh, an Indian in a conversation. And apart from that, I would say follow up with them via emails and via WhatsApps. Indians love WhatsApps. We use WhatsApp very often, very frequently for all personal and professional conversations. And Indians also love taking screenshots. So please ensure that your WhatsApp conversations are in line with your ethos and with what you'd want to be probably brought out in a couple of more you know, public domain chats. So I would say that's it from my end. And, I'm, um, and I think Indians are also less time constrained than Australians. So do not mind if they're late to a meeting or if they speak too much. And um, thank you so much for having me here today. And all the best to everyone who's trying to engage with India in the skills ecosystem. We're here to handhold you. Matt's here, I'm here, Sujit's here as well. And we'll be very happy to help you spark conversations in India in its India skilling journey. Thank you so much, Arushi. Those were very interesting insights, uh, you know, with an Indian flavor. <laughs> um, and Indian time, of course, is very interesting. Um, our next speaker is um, Sam Freeman, um, co-founder of Workforce. Um, Sam has navigated the Indian business landscape across a range of industries for over a decade. In 2012, he was a consultant with a university in Hyderabad as it launched its first uh, vocational education programs. In 2014, he moved to India full-time to set up and manage First Impression Resources, which, is, which was his family's Indian arm of RTO to deliver a range of vet initiatives in India. In 2021, Sam worked as the Australian Trade and Investment Commissioner with focus on enabling Australian technology firms to enter the Indian market and access the talent available within. Sam, over to you now. Thanks, Dr. Sujit, and uh, thank you very much to AII and all the panelists um, that I'm privileged to join today for making this happen. Uh, fantastic to hear the insights so far, and, and I know uh, Bijo will also be excellent. I think uh, a lot of people look at doing business across cultures through a series of metrics. Thanks, Bree. Um, and they want to analyze things like communication styles, hierarchy, negotiation techniques. I think Arushi just did a great job of giving some of this insight. Um, and they look at that and say, how do I adjust my style to India in order to best succeed? Um, as I said, Arushi's done a great job of talking about that. And and I think a lot of that information is out there online. For the fun of it, I spoke to my friend ChatGPT and got these insights. Um, so I'd implore you to go and do that yourself because I'm going to spend the next seven minutes talking about my journey over the past decade or so and the learnings that I've accrued. Um, my journey has been hands-on. I live there full time. It's all trial and error, almost all trial and error. And over the past few years, all the mistakes I've made, which I'll get into, um, helped me give better advice when I was the trade commissioner to businesses looking to enter India. And nowadays, it all influences how my uh, business partner and I are building workforce. So um, 
I've got three mistakes that I'm going to talk to you about. And my wife pointed out to me last night that uh, that also aligns to the fantastic Indian author Chetan Bhagat's book, The Three Mistakes of My Life, um, which is compulsory reading. So absolutely get on uh, and get yourself a copy of that if you're interested in India. But um, Brie, to the next slide, please. Um, in my opinion, it's impossible to characterize India in a word or a phrase. And growth in India is so vastly different across regions. It's just, it's not a rural versus urban divide. It's city to city. And I think Nirti had mentioned some great uh, examples of that on her travels. And uh, I think her wonderful prose is much better than how I'll put it. But I'm going to give you a couple examples of uh, of my life in India and, and some of the differences that I've seen. So I lived in Hyderabad for eight years. Um, Hyderabad's a city that's grown significantly in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, there's a number of big players in the city. It's got a big tech focus. The big players who are in the city uh, often have developed their wealth through property and their political connections. And they run massive business houses. They do business in a pretty traditional manner. Um, they love relationships. They're key. And things take time to develop. Uh, for a couple of years, I ran an organization that was a joint venture partnership between one of these big business houses and a European firm. And every time the European firm, the partners in, in France would call me, they'd say, we need to talk about the gross margin. We need to talk about the EBITDA. We need to talk about what does the profit and loss look like this month? And when I'd relay that on to our Indian partners, their eyes would glaze over. But if I sat down and, and talked to them, had tea, coffee, uh, I played in their annual cricket tournament on a Saturday, uh, which was just an inter, um, inter organization tournament, played very poorly by, by the mind you, but um, they would really open up. And that's where all the great opportunities came from and where the introductions to other organizations who helped us grow that business came from. So but on the flip side, I lived in Bengaluru for a couple of years and it's known as the Silicon Valley of India. It's a couple of hundred kilometers down the road. From the outside, these two cities look pretty similar, um, but most of the wealth there has come from the recent startup boom. And you'll find business is quicker, it's more transactional, and it's far less dependent on who you know. Uh, you're looking at what's the value. So the learning here is understand the diversity of India. Um, and that's going to take you time and effort to learn that. So that's my first mistake of first learning. Secondly, like anywhere in the world, doing business in India takes application and investment. Rightly or wrongly, India is looking for organizations to come in and invest big, hire a lot of people, and help them move their GDP towards the ambitious growth targets they have. And that's all fine. And that's why they paint these ideas of these huge numbers that need to be skilled. How many, you know, guys, we, we need this many hundreds of millions of people skilled by 2050 or whatever the targets are. Conversely, Australia is an SME economy, historically. We've got some big players, but for the most part, we're an SME economy. So there is a misalignment there. And when I ran First Impressions, or as some people know, at the Australian Retail College, we tried everything. And it really diluted our message to the Indian government and to our potential partners. And it diluted our focus. We were distracted by all these big numbers and all this potential that was on offer. And it reminds me of that movie that came out last year, Everything Everywhere All at Once. We were just all over the shop. On the other hand, while I was the trade commissioner, I worked closely with Swiss, the healthcare company, as they expanded across South Asia. And they didn't look at this 1.3 billion and you know this much GDP and all that sort of stuff. They were laser focused on who their target market was. They used social media marketing to target one side of the street in rich Mumbai suburbs because their target market didn't live on the other side. Now they had invested time and effort to get that information, but that level of focus is how you achieve in India. And so the learning here is once you've done your analysis, identify your niche, don't try and be everything to everyone. Thirdly, 
and I think this is this is the biggest one for me. Our organisations, Australian organisations, and definitely the one I ran, very risk adverse. You know, we wanted to take time to weigh the risks, look at the opportunity cost, the potential threats, every time a new opportunity was presented to us. And because of this, we missed chances. Even though it's categorised as a mature market here in Australia, my experience is there's less competition here in, in skilling. In India, if you don't adopt the entrepreneurial spirit of India, you'll quickly find an infinite number of competitors, one or many of whom who will beat you to the punch. So you need to be ready to act. I had this great idea for an app at one point in our institute, and we were going to use it to put on the phones of all chai wallers and street merchants. And it was going to give them the ability to advertise our courses through to our target market who were all, you know, seeing their chai waller and seeing him every day and considering him a trustworthy fellow. And he was going to be able to um, help us gain credibility. And we were going to then obviously incentivize him with additional revenue source. We got a beta version of the app made, and then we proceeded to go nowhere with it because we looked at how we could start small with a pilot, where we would start, who we would work with, what are the risks, what are the problems that could go wrong. Now that functionality sits on every QR code scanning app that all of these merchants use to make their transactions like Paytm and the opportunity has well and truly passed. So the point here is like India has this entrepreneurial spirit that's different to Australia and you need to be ready to adopt that. So many businesses go there, they meet and they don't act. If you get an email, I think uh, Arushi kind of made mention to this about getting an email or getting a WhatsApp. You need to be ready to act on that because if you don't, the reality is these businesses are probably talking to 15 other people who will act on that same opportunity. Um, and yeah, it's kind of surprising. I mean, it reminds me of that famous Michael Jordan saying that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And it's exactly what's going to happen. Growth is so quick in India right now. Uh, and it has been for the last decade that I've seen. If you're not ready to move, you're just, you're going to lose out. So look, that's all from me uh, right now. Thank you everyone for the chance to have a chat and, and also to hear from such a fantastic array of uh, panelists. Back to you, Dr. Sajid. Thank you, Sam. That, that was very interesting. First-hand experience on the ground. Um, I now turn to Bicho, who has extensive project management and business management experience in a career spanning or transversing over three decades in Australia, having worked in Australia, Malaysia, and India. He has leveraged his experience to enable new and innovative programs that impact career-focused healthcare training. As the managing director of HCI, his, he oversees and manages the operations, um, the activities and policy implementation of HCI in all the locations. Um, over to you, Bijo. Hello. Good afternoon to everyone. And thanks to Australia India Institute for inviting me to participate in this uh, skills masterclass. I would like to uh, give some background about our institution and me. So we started in 2004 in Melbourne, Healthcare is International as a training and placement organization for nurses. And we are continuing to do that for the last two decades. And we have a focusing on uh, now beyond nursing, well, we have around 18 courses in scope offering a lot of healthcare education, but we always remain in health space. We haven't gone beyond health. And in 2017, we started our ambition in India. We started our offshore delivery. We have to register with ASK as a offshore campus. In 2017, we registered and uh, we start our operation in a small way in Cochin in Kerala, where I am from. In terms of uh, going offshore, you need to have a very strong online learning and teaching strategies. So, IHNA Institute of Health and Nursing Hospital our vocational division started uh, online learning and teaching in 2012 with the first accreditation of a 
nursing reentry program by NMAC, Austin Nursing Council in 2012. We may be the first private provider going into a fully online delivery of program in Australia in 2012 with the nursing board. From there, we start building our capability, and uh, I think uh, we 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 have actually always uh, focused on our values: innovation, caring, and excellence. So, I would like to explain how the organization operates within that three key values, and how we uh, can connect it to cultural diplomacy, the the soft power of uh, people. So, we basically looking into individual development and cultural respect as well as person-to-person uh, -person connection. So in terms of uh, HCI, we we have started in uh, Cochin and it was around five students in a year around uh, 2017. And the, the operation was very slow and I was a bit concerned. And so because uh, 2020, the pandemic also hit, we have a lot of other challenges. But in 2021, Australian government announced its international education strategy that really promote offshore and online delivery and promoting Australian education providers to try beyond Australian borders. Because we're always looking into international students coming to study in Australia, but nothing much. Like UK does a lot in that space, but uh, Australia was always reluctant. The main reason was the the... the Regulatory compliance was always considered to be high risk when we go beyond the Australian border by ASCO. But with the Australian government publicly announcing the strategy, I thought, let us take a chance because the government is promoting, Australia is promoting uh, Victorian business office in Bangalore is with me to promote. Everything is supportive. So why don't we try a little bit further? So by 2021, with the strategy implementation, I thought, let us do something good. In 2022, we start promoting again in Cochin. And in 2023, we have reached around 500 enrollments this year. So it's a basically, it's a time consuming, it's a risk taking, and it's growing. And uh, healthcare education is globally demanding now. So because of that, students are trying to get Australian education and uh, trying to get jobs globally. So in terms of uh, innovation, we actually inbuilt uh, technology or digital literacy into the program by offering uh, because healthcare training need more than just online learning. It's basically need a lot of practical learning. So how do you bring practical training into online environment? So we've done a lot of uh, uh, investment into stimulation training and also building a lot of uh, practices by implementing hollow lenses and other technology into the operations, into training, along with uh, uh, connecting with the Indian hospitals and the nursing homes in Kerala to give them practical training in in-house. We have a lot of residential aged care homes in Kerala now. So we're utilizing all those uh, opportunity to, to give training. So we always uh, thinking that uh, this building digital capability to our students will make them opportunity to globally. They can work in India, they can work in any country because hospitals and health system is totally digitalized now. And come to the second value, which is uh, caring. You can move to the next slide in reality. So the, cal the, the, care the caring values comes with the, the, host the health system is basically based on caring value. And we are looking into cultural competence for our education. So in Australia, we have education. All the courses have specific modules on uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait and the health and the cultural aspect of uh, caring them. So I think the same thing in India, we have multicultural society. We have so many cultures, so many relig religions. So we need to understand and respect others. So Australian value, you know, the respect is brought into our training and we actually building that value. I believe that cultural connection between India and Australia will build that soft power, will build through this learning, which our students getting through the Australian education. And comes to the third, third uh, our value is uh, excellence. The next slide, basically, in excellence, we looking into global opportunity and the global competence. So people studying with us, we are actually focusing on education for employment. So we bringing our, our graduate attributes to be focusing to training, soft, tra soft skills training to our students along with the main course. And we work with industry and we have a lot of industry engagement in order to connect our students with the industry so that they can be finally getting the job. So with the job experience and uh, Australian education and 
aligning it with the Indian standards, I think the students can be working globally and that global opportunity we are creating. And in the classes, we're mixing Indian students with Australian students in the virtual space. So that also gives them person-to-person -person connection. That's again, is a soft power which they're building through this education program. So these are the very much for three benefits of the program which we're offering in terms of a cultural diplomacy point of view. And comes to the challenges, the next slide. I mean, I just want to share that uh, mainly when we're going for beyond Australia, the regulatory compliances are very high. So we need to really look at all matters, not only quality education delivery, compliance aspect. So the teachers must have TA qualification and also must be assessed and uh, completed by a Australian educator. So a lot of uh, uh, careful consideration to be given in order to deliver programs beyond Australia. And that should be of the same standard of what we're doing in Australia should be delivered in India. So we need to make sure that we don't miss anything. That will make sure that we can deliver AQ of qualification beyond Australia. So we are practicing with the small numbers for the last five years. This year, actually, is, uh, you know, we have a staff trained, we have systems and we have uh, facilities now improved in this year. These are all helping us to uh, go to the next level. And main important thing is when you go to Kerala, we have to work with the industry there, with the hospitals and nursing homes and other uh, education institutions. So we need to be collaborative and that collaboration take time as trust building take time. So I normally visit every three months to India and tomorrow I'm going to India to celebrate Onam with uh, our staff there. We have around 300 staff working in Cochin and uh, 300 in Australia. And in terms of uh, economic consideration, it's also very important when you want to deliver an Australian qualification, Australian standards beyond Australia, it costs the institution more than delivering in Australia. So that is comes to the cost. The training cost is much expensive compared to Indian course. So we can't compete with any course in India. It should be a differently priced. And the market is there, but it's slow. Because to, uh, students traveling to Australia, UK, Canada, and other countries already taken our training and got jobs in those countries as well. So that's a very good uh, opportunity we created for many students. And I continue to work with Australia and uh, Victorian uh, government office to promote our programs in across India. That's our plan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Bijo. Interesting, big projects. I'm now going to take some questions um, from the audience. Um, the first question is, is Australia ready to develop bridging courses between India and Australia? Um, could I ask Matt and Arushi to address this one and then maybe Bijo, you can add something to it? Certainly, Sajit. I think what Bijo was just finishing on in his presentation actually does address this um, this somewhat, and that's the um, Australia need Australia can have a look at you know what is already being delivered in India and how can you add on in terms of way of managing some of those um, additional costs that Bijou um, mentioned. I do think the sector is from Australia is capable and does do this, you know, well in terms of alternative delivery models and um, mm -hmm. being able to look at the different qualifications and what is the add-on in terms of if you're considering pathways to Australia or particular requirements for jobs um, in Australia as well. But I think Biju's um, presentation really sort of crystallised, I think, um, methods in which you can look at doing this if you're an RTO or uh, another institution based in Australia seeking to partner and to deliver into India. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would, I'm sorry, Sushi, please go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to ask you to respond next. Yeah, I would say that Biju and Matthew both were very comprehensive. And I think the only top up that I could think of is that um, when you enter the Indian market, your course and offerings have to be extremely customized to what your Indian customers' demands are. Um, so as long as you're able to give them give them a solution to that problem and sort of solve for that problem, I would say it's a good time to think about um, any, whether it's a bridging course or any other type of a skilling or an upskilling course. As long as you're customized, you hear what Biju is telling you, I think it's a good time to go ahead with that. Biju, is there anything you want to add to that? Although you gave us a very elaborate 
Yeah. I think in terms of nursing, I can say we have a bridging program for nurses for the last 20 years. And I think we have placed more than 20, 25,000 nurses in Australia. Every hospital in Australia have IHN students or nurses currently. Mm -hmm. So that is the scale we have done for many years. But the bridging program in Australia, APRA changed the model this year. And uh, we are able to continue to do it in a better way now. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have an education module for it. So bridging program is... Uh, something which uh, in nursing workspace we are always doing. And I think uh, now we have a mutual recognition or OSCE arrangement with the UK and other countries. So people come into Australia, we provide them a short course in order to get them into the workplace. So in nursing space, bridging is always accepted. Um, our next question, um, Arushi spoke about the middle class growing appetite for skilling. Is there any consideration of the lower class, which is arguable of one attractive for skill-based vocations? Um, I would say um, when you look at the middle class, as I mentioned before, it is highly aspirational. So they would want to see the aspirational value or the end outcome of a particular upskilling course. Where will a student lead post he completes or finishes that course? So I would say it's a great time to try to tap onto that target group, which is highly competitive, which does give a lot of emphasis to educational qualifications. The middle class parents do want to ensure that they're able to give their children international exposure, that the student or the child is able to not only compete domestically, but also is able to learn from the global um, from the globe, I think from the global economy, from the global markets. Um, so I would say that um, I would say it's a good time to look at it that way that you're able to bring out the aspirational quotient, what value add a particular course is providing to a particular Indian target group, whether it's the middle class or the elite class. Um, so I would say, yeah, that, that I think that would be a repetition of what I said, spoke before. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Sam and for Neerti. Um, Do location for services matter? And Neerti, if we're talking about location, does a provider have to be wary of the cultural aspects of that location? Sam, do you want to go first? Please. I think, Neerti, why don't you go first? Ladies first. <laughs> Uh, yes, I do think uh, the location matters a lot and the geography because by being there or understanding its nuances, you get a better understanding of how to deal contextually as well as how to be able to connect. I think it's very important. We've discussed the people to people connect and we keep thinking because we are all people and we all have cultures and you know we have music in common, we all can just naturally connect. Most often we do, but I think it's very important that we, you know, also speak that same language of cultural connects. So I would uh, definitely believe that either, you know, tra through travel or through meeting people who've been to that particular place, it all makes a difference, just knowing a bit more about it. Sam? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think if I split it into two areas, it matters that you have to be there. Um, to do business in India, you have to be there. It's not a fly in, fly out kind of market. In fact, I think there's very few of those around the world. But the other aspect is, I just give you a small anecdote, you know, understanding the cultural aspects. We delivered a program training of trainers uh, in Delhi and um, they asked specifically for one of our master trainers from Australia to come over and for it to be supplemented by an, a Hindi uh, speaking uh, support teacher. So we took our basically our master trainer in India um, who was able to then do any and all translation that was required. Not that there was a lot, as Niyati referenced earlier, English is a predominant language in business. Um, but we're sitting down at, again over tea uh, with some of the participants, getting some feedback from them. And they were talking about some of the struggles they had in the nuance of Hindi. The person who we'd sent along was a Hyderabadi and their Hindi involved some Urdu, some, you know, remnants of Telugu as well that they would speak casually at home. 
And it was slightly different to the type of Hindi that's spoken with a lot of the North Indian communities. So, yeah, there's very interesting small details that you do have to pick up on. Um, and, yeah, you can't just read about them. You have to be there. So I, I think I agree wholeheartedly with Nieti's answer. Um, I just lost some questions. Questions are coming in fast, very fast. Um, if you could keep your answers short, I'd be happy. Biju, we have our audience um, wishing you happy Onam. Um, are you saying that Australian institutions have to revise their fees downwards in the skill-based vocational course offerings to make them more competitive and attractive to aspiring Indian students? And the next one is also for you. This week, the Indian Education Minister has met with the Australian Health Minister. What are the recent developments that will help reduce the shortage of aged care workers and nurses in Australia? Um, I'll, I'll pose the next two questions. There's a third one for you as well. Regarding your model in India, do you train young people to become nurses and other health professionals to work in Indian hospitals and clinics? I think you said you do. Um, or do you upskill Indian health professionals seeking to work abroad? Um, there is the last question here before I move on to something else. Students onshore in Australia should also be taken into consideration. I think that's for you, Biju, um, with what the Indian Education Minister was talking about. So if you could just wrap those up together, then I can move on to the last question. Okay. I mean, in terms of the fees and all as individual institutions has to decide what's the fees which they can affordably deliver offshore. So normally, you know, international students pay much higher fees in Australia when they're studying full-time course here as an international student. But normally, we our, our case, we are offering domestic student fees in India. So it's a, considered like a domestic fees what we charge in Australia. So it's much less than international student paying in Australia. So that's one of the benefits. And then normally, the courses provide them opportunity for upskilling or maybe a full new qualification. That's the opportunity they get because if they are upskilling, they get a RPL option in the course. If any course they're done in India, we can provide them RPL and recognition of prior learning RPL. So that the, the third, uh, third component is that you know, they, they will be, they, they have uh, many choices. I mean, this the, the programs are custom, like Australian education is based on competency-based training. That means uh, some people may be able to, it is individualized training. Anybody is, everybody is different. So people could work individually on their area and they build their capability, which meets Australian standards. And also they could work in Indian uh, hospitals or healthcare system. And many of the people, I also expect that they will go to Middle East and work as a you know, place where they want to expose further. And in, in terms of uh, the any other question, I think I covered most of it, so. I think you covered most of that. Um, thank yeah. you very much to our audience. That's all the time we have, but I'm coming back to all the speakers. Um, could you, if I was to ask you to give us one key takeaway from this webinar today, could you give us that one key takeaway in 30 seconds or less, please? We'll start with you, Matt. Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess my key takeaway is that the skills ecosystem in India, like the higher education one, is really changing very rapidly. But the development of the skill system is not the same, is not at the same stage as higher education. So you need to be more nuanced in thinking about how you enter um, collaborations in India. Um, that said, everything is changing really quickly and India is really seeking to make up time in terms of the evolution and the quality of its systems. So this means that there are now more similarities between our two countries making um, partnerships, genuine partnerships are uh, more possible. But just remember that the language, the ambition and the approach to getting there between the two countries um, are not the same, which requires us to a bit more flexibility and a little bit of creativity to find um, mutually beneficial outcomes um, for successful collaborations. That was quite long, Nieti. <laughs> Culture is a unique and extremely powerful enabler, and I hope that both our countries continue to build cultural bridges. Thank you. Um, Arushi? 
Thanks, Rajit. I'll try to make it really quick. It is that skilling is the need of the hour in India. So try to solve for India's skilling problems. And please do invest in building trust and cementing your relationships with the Indian customers. Over to Sam. Thank you. Yeah, th the three things. Analyze, focus, act. Those are the three things I learned from my mistakes. Excellent. Biju? Yeah. Uh, I would like to say that, you know, everything takes time and uh, building a brand and brand awareness and uh, credibility in a new market will take a lot of efforts and uh, uh, persistence. So need to be consistent in what we want to achieve. So like we are there for in India for five years or more to get what we want to we see the result now. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Australia India Institute, I wish to express my thanks to all of our guest speakers today for contributing to this webinar. I'd also like to thank the Australian government and the Department of Education for supporting these master classes. It's an exciting time to understand India's evolving vet educational systems that is endeavoring to skilling, reskilling, and upskilling its youth, both for domestic and the international markets. To our audience, Thank you very much for joining today's Skilled Masterclass. We would encourage you to watch out for other Masterclass recordings. Our next one is on case studies of Australian vocational education providers in India. And a big thank you to our communication manager, Brina, for handling this webinar. Thank you. That's all we have for today. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.